I'm going to talk tonight about, I'm going to talk for about 45 minutes and, I, and then I hope we'll have time for some questions. Uh, I'm going to talk about peak water, I'm going to talk about water and conflict in international security, I'm going to talk a little bit about climate change and water, uh, I'm going to talk about the rev what we call the Revolutionary War on my side of the Atlantic and the, the role of Britain in burning New York in 1776, I think it was. Uh, I'm going to talk about communications around war issues. Uh, I'm not going to talk about privatization and globalization and commodification per se. I'm not going to talk about water equity. I'm not going to talk about uh, bottled water. Uh, well, I wrote a book about bottled water a couple of years ago. And I have to say that, that uh, maybe it's kind enough uh, to give me some, some tap water uh, and I'm requested water and not bottled water. Uh, I'm not going to talk per se about soft path solutions, although much of what I'm going to say is implicit in the work that I've done around the soft path. So let me start with this idea of peak water. Uh, most of you have probably heard about peak oil, and I'll talk a little bit about peak oil and what it means, but I'm going to talk about peak water. A colleague of mine, uh, Mina Polignac, and I wrote a paper that came out a couple of years ago uh, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences about peak water, in which we discuss the concept and its application. And I'm going to talk about it in the context of three curves. The first is the classic exponential curve that all of you know, uh, related to all sorts of things in the physical world, in the economic world, and, and the environmental world. Uh, we see exponential curves in a lot of different places. This is the exponential curve of population from the year 1000 to the year 2000, showing the growth of population from a very small level to the current 7 billion, and it's going to go to 8, and then 9, and I'm not sure where it's going to end up. Although you can actually see maybe at the top it's starting to, starting to move away from an exponential growth curve. But that's a classic exponential curve that we're all familiar with. Um, the population, the uh, concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, again from the year 1000 to the year 2000, uh, showing the exponential growth in CO2 concentrations and by implication greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. And this is, in many ways, the climate problem, that exponential curve as well. I'm going to talk about this curve, that is uh, the exponential growth curve, followed by a peak, followed by a leveling off and a decline in something. And we see this in the natural world as well, uh, or in the economic world as well sometimes. Uh, and the classic definition of peak oil refers to this curve. Uh, 1970, uh, a geologist named Hubbard uh, projected that there would be something called peak oil, that we would see a peak in the production of oil. And in the United States, in fact, peak oil was around 1970. And in the United States, we produce less oil now than we did in the 1970s, and it's continued to decline. Uh, there's some question about when and how the world will reach a production peak for oil. Uh, but I think that's coming as well. But we also see it in, in natural phenomena and ecosystems. This is a, a curve of Atlantic cod capture um, from 1950 to about the year 2000, 2000 actually about 2010, showing a peak in the capture of Atlantic cod and then a collapse in the cod production, uh, in part because of a collapse of the ecosystem in the Atlantic uh, and a decrease in the productivity of the cod fisher in the Atlantic. So we see it in natural resources, we see it in, in non-renewable resources, we see it in a lot of different kinds of curves. And I'll come back to water uh, when I talk about water. The third curve is the classic logistics curve. A uh, low level of something in exponential growth and then a leveling off and then a sustaining of something. We see this kind of curve in lots of dynamics as well. Uh, we see it in technology penetration of technology. So something that we all want, but didn't know we wanted, is invented. The telephone. In the year, two, in the year 1900, up to the year 2000. The telephone's invented. It's a wonderful technology. Everybody gets one. And then when everybody has one, the numbers of telephones out in the market levels off. Uh, uh, you see this for VCRs, you see it for CDs, you see it for all sorts of tech, for, for PCs, for the personal computer. You see it leveling off once the market penetration 
rates have been reached. Uh, you'll see it for cell phones. In fact, if this is all telephones, perhaps it might grow with population, uh, but the number of landlines may start to drop. It may have a peak and then a decline when it's replaced by cell phones. Cell phones may then be replaced by smartphones. I can see an exponential increase and then a leveling off when everybody has a, has a smartphone. Uh, and we see this curve pretty regularly in technology. But we also see it in all sorts of other things. This is a curve that shows globally the cumulative dam capacity, the storage of water behind dams worldwide from about 1850 to about 2010, showing uh, an exponential increase in the storage of water behind big dams as we started to build big dams worldwide. And I'll show this curve again later in my talk. Followed by a leveling off. Why? I'll come back to that. Now, in the water context, before I talk explicitly about peak water, uh, there are certain characteristics of water that are of interest. We tend to think about water as a renewable resource. You all, of course, remember from your pre-university years about the hydrologic cycle and evaporation, the formation of clouds, condensation, precipitation, runoff, back to evaporation. That's the hydrologic cycle, and it's a renewable system. Water is a renewable resource. It's in many ways, like solar energy, a classic renewable resource. Um, but let me define two terms, uh, renewable and non-renewable, just to give you a, a basic background. Non-renewable resources are considered stock limited. They're limited by the amount of something that's there. And think about oil for a minute. Oil is a non-renewable resource in the short term. It's created by uh, the decay of vegetation over millennia, really thousands of years, eons. And from a human perspective, our extraction of oil is not renewable. We take it out from a stock. The amount of oil we can get is limited by the stock that's there. That's sort of a classic definition of non-renewable resource. It's stock limited. You can't take out more than is there. A renewable resource in contrast, is flow limited. It's renewable. The flow is ongoing and potentially infinite. And think about solar energy as the classic renewable resource. The amount of energy that the sun produces is vast. And the amount that humans can capture is limited by the amount that falls on the surface of the Earth. Now, presumably, we could build big satellites and expand the area that we capture solar energy but it's limited by the flow that we can capture. The amount that we use has no effect whatsoever on what the sun produces tomorrow. It's not stock limited. We're not using it up. That's a, that's a renewable resource. It's flow limited as opposed to stock resource, as, as opposed to stock limited. Water and energy actually exhibit characteristics of both. Uh, there are renewable energy resources, solar energy, it's an energy resource that's renewable, unlike oil, which is a, which is a non-renewable resource. Water is mostly a renewable resource, but water also has some non-renewable characteristics. And remember that, and I'll come back to that too in my discussion about peak water. So, back to these curves. I'm going to define three kinds of peak water. Peak renewable water, peak non-renewable water, and what we call peak ecological. Peak renewable water is sort of this curve. When water is a renewable resource and humans start to tap it, we increase our demand on the renewable resource. And then once we're capturing the entire flow of some renewable resource, we can keep taking all of it, but we can't take any more. The exponential curve has to level off. And there's variability Resources. If you think about this in terms of a river, there's a certain amount of average flow of the river. And once we take it all, we might be able to continue to take it all on average, but we can't have any more. Now, there are wet years, there are dry years, so the total amount that we can take may vary from year to year. But that's peak renewable water. That's a, a, a clear definition of the limits of even a renewable resource the total renewable supply. 
Now, that begs the question, how much should we actually take? And the whole debate in the water world about ecological value is partly a debate about having reached peak renewable limits on a number of rivers, we're beginning to realize, well, maybe for ecological reasons, we don't want to take the whole thing. We want to leave flows in the river. But that's a different piece of this water debate. So the question is, how much should we actually use? And in fact, I would like to argue that in many parts of the world, we're already approaching peak renewable limits on our natural flows. This is a graph of the flow of the Colorado River in the southwestern part of the United States from 1905 to 2006, 2007. The y-axis is a million cubic meters per year. And this shows a number of things. A little bit of background for those of you who aren't familiar with the, with the region. The Colorado River is the biggest river in the southwestern part of the United States. It's shared by seven states. It arises in the mountains of the Rocky Mountains as snow melt and runs off. And it ends up in Mexico. It's, it's an international river. It's shared by the US and Mexico. We have a treaty that allocates waters of the Colorado to the US and Mexico. This is a measurement of flow at the mouth of the Colorado, at the end of the river, of the delta, what's called the Southern International Border. And it shows a number of things. First of all, it shows declining flows at the delta. It also shows ups and downs. This is the natural variability. In the early part of the 20th century, there were not that many human demands on water. There was very little infrastructure, like many rivers in the early part of the 19th, 1900s. So we had wet years, we had dry years, and there was a lot of flow that reached the delta. As the 20th century progressed, we started irrigating land in the western United States. The cities in the west started to grow. We started to withdraw water for aqueducts and move it out of the basin. Uh, we built big dams, and the flows started to drop. Some of the biggest dams in the United States are on the Colorado River. The Colorado River also is the river that flows through the Grand Canyon. Just don't worry, some. And by the early 1960s, when the big dams were completed, and the big irrigation systems were put in place, and the cities were taking the water, flows in the delta reached zero. Basically, we took the entire renewable flow. We reached peak water on the Colorado River. Now, occasionally, in really, really wet years, and 1983 was a really, really wet year, when the reservoirs are full and we can't store any more water, some flows still reach the delta. But that's an abnormality. Uh, and that's peak renewable water, water on the Colorado. We might like more water out of the Colorado, but we can't have it. This is another example of peak water, another way of thinking. This is that reservoir curve that I described. It's global reservoir capacity from 1900 to about 2010. Uh, the y-axis is cubic kilometers of storage, total volume of water stored behind the big dams. And it shows, you know, 1900, we had very few big dams. And we started to build dams in the 1950s and the 1960s and the 70s were a period of enormous construction. We built bigger and bigger dams in the United States and in the Soviet Union and in other parts of the world. And then it started to level off. And it leveled off for a variety of reasons. We reached, to some degree, I would argue, peak reservoir storage. Now, we will still build more big dams, a few big dams. I think this, number, this volume may go up a little bit, but it's not going to resume its exponential growth, in my opinion, for a whole series of, of reasons. One is, We've built on all, almost all of the good dam sites. We've built on a lot of bad dam sites, too. That's a, that's a discussion to get out of some other time. This was a period where we didn't care about or we didn't understand the ecological consequences of big dam construction. And we do more today understand those implications. And so from an ecological point of view, it's increasingly controversial to build big dams now. So there are ecological constraints. There are economic constraints. This was a period of time when governments, especially in the United States and the Soviet Union, heavily subsidized at the federal level big dam construction because they were promoting irrigation and in India as well, I would argue. 
They were trying to expand food production. They were expanding hydropower production. And governments paid for a lot of that construction. And government finances and budgets are different in the 21st century than they were in the 20th century, almost everywhere. And it's harder and harder to find financing for these projects if you look at the true economics of them. When we didn't care about cost benefits, or we didn't understand cost benefits, this curve was a lot easier to sustain. So, and finally, there are political reasons as well. There are community implications of building big dams. Communities get flooded, communities downstream lose water access when water is restored, is stored by dams and taken out for irrigation to a different basin. So there are economic constraints, there are political constraints, there are environmental constraints, and there are physical constraints, all of which are involved in this curve. This is a curve of total water withdrawals in the United States, and I would argue is another example of peak water. This is total water withdrawals for everything, for irrigation, for power plant cooling, for residential and industrial and commercial uses, uh, all total water withdrawals in the United States. From 1900, again, to about 2005, uh, the y-axis is cubic kilometers per year in withdrawals, and it shows a couple of things. First, it shows exponential demands increasing for water over the early part of the 20th century. As the economy grew and as populations grew, this is sort of the classic assumption in the 20th century for water planners and water managers. I was, a trained, I was trained as a hydrologist and an engineer, partly. Uh, I was trained to assume that as populations grow and as the economy grows, demand for water is going to grow in lockstep. And that was true for a while. But in the late 70s and early 80s, the United States reached peak water. We use less water in the United States today for everything than we used 30 years ago. And on a per capita basis, we use a lot less per person because populations continue to grow. So per capita water is water use divided by the population. So per capita water use has dropped even more than this drop from peak water. Why? A lot of reasons, and I actually think there's a dissertation here that hasn't been done. If anyone's looking, I keep trying to push this on US PhD students, but I'm not yet. Part of it is physical. We might want more water out of the Colorado River in the western US, but we can't have it. There's a physical constraint. Part of it is economic. We're beginning to price water a little more realistically. Part of it is technological. We're using more efficient approaches for producing the goods and services that we want. We're growing more food with less water. Our toilets and washing machines are more efficient than they used to be. We're meeting our demands with less water. All of those play, the, the structure of our economy has changed. Partly, we've exported, and this is something Professor Allen understands better than most, are water production costs to other places where more water intensive industries are now uh, uh, producing somewhere else and we're importing water in the goods and services that we consume. All of those things are implicit, I believe, in this, this curve. Now, will this curve go back up in the future? Maybe. But there are physical, economic, environmental constraints. I think to some degree, one could argue we've reached the water. The other side of this is that if you continue this curve exponentially up with, in parallel with the economy and population, we would have had to have found double this amount of water to be demands today. It would have required another 850 cubic kilometers of water per year. And to be honest, I don't know where we would have found that water in the United States. We don't have 850 cubic kilometers of, of water that for environmental, economic, political, and, and social reasons we could tap. So in that sense, it's a good thing. So that's peak renewable water. Peak non-renewable water follows this curve. That is, exponential growth followed by a peak, followed by a decline. And I said earlier that some water resources are renewable, some are non-renewable. 
There are certain groundwater aquifers in particular that are classic non-renewable resources, just like oil. They should be thought about, they should be thought of as stocks, not flows. When you consume groundwater faster than nature naturally recharges it, it's a non-renewable resource. And we see non-renewable groundwater, fossil groundwater, in the Central Valley of California, the Ogallala Aquifer, the Great Plains of the United States, in Libya, in the North China Plains, in parts of India. A substantial amount of groundwater that's used worldwide is non-renewable groundwater. It's recharged, it may be recharged faster than oil is, is created on geologic times. But in some places, not much. Think about Libya. There's vast resources of groundwater under Libya. But it's not being recharged by natural precipitation, which is the source of natural re recharge, typically. And in that sense, you see peak, you see an increase in groundwater use. You'll see a peak, ultimately. And then you'll see a decline as the economic costs of pumping grow. You overpump a groundwater aquifer, the levels drop, it becomes more expensive to pump. And so there's an economic component to this. And that's a non-renewable peak. That's peak non-renewable water. And here's an example. This is the pumping of groundwater from under Bangkok. And it shows, over time, an increase in total pumping, followed by a peak, followed by a decline. So the cost of pumping exceeded the value of the water. And we see it elsewhere as well. This is the overall aquifer that I mentioned, showing enormous drops in the groundwater level. The red color is big drops, uh, more than 40 feet or more than 20 or 40 feet in declines in groundwater level. But there are parts of India that are losing groundwater meters, multiple meters, tens of meters a year. Uh, very rapid decline in groundwater level. And in parts of this region, just to orient you, this is South Dakota, Nebraska, Colorado, Kansas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, Texas. This is really the, the great, what we call the Great Plains of California. It's, a, it's where a tremendous amount of field, a tremendous volume of field crops are grown in wheat, soybeans, uh, corn. Uh, and in many parts of this region, because of these declines in groundwater levels, farmers have brought out of production. They've gone back to rain fed agriculture because they can't afford pumping costs, and their pumping is declining. Um, this is, to the extent that I was able to find it, and I, I can promise better data if I, if, I can, if I can get it, but this is total water use in England and Wales uh, in megaliters per year uh, for 1990, 2000, and 2008 uh, by sector, residential, commercial, agricultural, electricity and gas production, and industrial, showing the decline in water withdrawals uh, in this region. Primarily, it looks like from changes in agriculture. Uh, is this an example of peak water, peak non renewable water, peak renewable water? Uh, maybe there's a dissertation here too, as well. But you guys have better data. The third concept is peak ecological water. Uh, the y axis I'm going to draw here is total economic and ecological value of water as a function of the amount of water we appropriate. So, Increasing appropriation of water by humans and total value of that water to us. And I would like to argue that follows this kind of a curve, where at very low levels of withdrawal, very low levels of appropriation, the value that we get out of that water grows, but perhaps exponentially. Uh, we produce more food, we, we make more semiconductors. Uh, there's an increasing economic value to that water use. But at a certain point, we reach what I would argue is peak ecological water, by which I mean the next unit of water that we appropriate causes more ecological harm than it produces economic value. And so the value, the total value, the addition of the economic value and the ecological value starts to actually decline because ecological costs exceed the marginal economic value you can get. Now, I'm going to be the first to acknowledge that we're really bad at measuring, economic, at measuring ecological value. And a lot of the work that's being done here is looking at the ecological value of water and how we think about it. It's a very exciting area in the water world today. 
but there is an ecological value to our water use. It's not zero. And so we might not be able to say exactly when a system reaches e peak ecological water. But I would argue that in some places we're past that point already. And I would point to, for example, the RLC, uh, where water withdrawals from the RLC in Central Asia, out of the Amudari and the Siriyari River, have caused a diminishing volume and an increasing salinity in the RLC. That water was taken out to grow cotton uh, in Uzbekistan, and Kazakhstan, and Tajikistan. All 24 species of fish that were only endemic to the RLC are now extinct. This may be a subjective value judgment on my part, but I would argue that that ecological cost is greater than the economic value of the cotton we produce out of the RLC. So again, that's until we're really good at putting a dollar value on ecological value, it's to some degree a subjective point. But the concept of peak ecological water is an increasingly important one in the way we think about water management, in the decisions we make about building big dams, or tapping groundwater, or what we choose to grow in different regions. And that's the concept of peak ecological water. OK. So let me talk about security and conflict and the role of peak water in that context. First of all, definitions of security vary. Now are expanding. And I understand there was a, an interesting debate here a few weeks ago, was it, uh, about the value of securitizing environmental goods and services. Um, that's to some degree an academic debate. Uh, I've been involved in it for a long time. There are a lot of different definitions of security, from the classic rail politique in the 1960s and 70s and 80s, that is superpower politics and, uh, and the Cold War to the field of environmental security and what it means, and the broader field now of human security and what it means. Definitions of security change over time. It's interesting because um, when I was involved in the 1980s, there was some, some concern that if you argue that there is such a thing as environmental security, you're diminishing the what was considered to be the real debate about real politics and the international security, narrow international security state. And I had to point out at the time that superpower politics was itself uh, a definition of security that was subsequent to, the, to World War II, uh, developed in the Cold War era. And it was a different definition before the Cold War. So definitions vary. <coughs> but I would argue in the real world, there's a long history of conflict over water. One of the things we do at the Pacific Institute is we maintain something called the water conflict chronology. And if you're interested in history, you're interested in the security issue, Google water conflict chronology or, or go to worldwater.org. And there is a, a searchable database of hundreds of examples of conflicts over water, or the use of water as a weapon, or water systems as a target of conflicts that start for other reasons entirely, going back 5,000 years. Uh, it's actually quite an interesting database. And it takes many forms. Sometimes we fight over water. I want your water as a resource. Sometimes water is used as a weapon. Sometimes it's a target. Uh, sometimes it's a development dispute. It's an issue of conflict over equity and access. Uh, we see increasing examples of water and conflict in the, in the area of terrorism and subnational disputes. But I would argue that, and I'm going to show you why I think this, that the risks of water-related disputes are growing, not shrinking, including over the issue of what I would describe as peak water. Typically, peak renewable and non-renewable water, not peak ecological water per se, but I think that's a possibility uh, as well in the future. And I think water factors in general are going to have uh, both direct and increasingly indirect impacts on the issues of security and conflict that concern us. So this is actually a screenshot from our water conflict chronology. Um, it's an interactive Google map. You can actually click on any of these conflicts. You can sort by region. You can sort by type of conflict. You can sort by time period. Uh, you can click on any particular entry. You can get access to the specific uh, citations, the, the academic citations that provide more information about each of those conflicts. Um, 
It's a lot of fun. And we're just about, we haven't yet, uh, but we're just about in the next month or so going to update it for 2011 and 2012. We update it every two years. We probably have updated update it every week, but we're about to update it for the last two years. This is a graph uh, that shows total reported, reported water-related conflicts uh, in the number uh, from 1931 to 2012. This includes the 2011 and this graph is why, I argue, I think we're seeing an increase in water-related conflicts. Now, that's a hypothesis, not a fact. The fact is we're seeing an increase in the number of reported conflicts. The hypothesis is that the number of conflicts over water is growing. But the reality is we're also a lot better at reporting than we used to be. Uh, today, when there's a, even a small regional dispute where there's violence over water, and I would note that the, the chronology is violent conflicts over water, it's reported immediately on the internet. I get it on Twitter, I get, tw I get it on Twitter in a couple of minutes, typically, or it's on a news feed that, that I get on my, on my web, the websites that I see. So we're reporting more efficiently. Uh, whether or not there's a real increase in the number of I'm not sure, but I, I believe there is. But I acknowledge the reporting challenge. That's a data issue. But it's more than this. If you split it by nation to nation conflicts and subnational conflicts, you see an interesting trend. And that is a growing increase in subnational conflicts as opposed to national conflicts, although they're both growing. As you'll see, the red line is subnational conflicts, the blue line is state-to-state -state conflicts, where water crosses an international border and nations are involved. This, by the way, is World War II. Lots of water conflicts in World War II, the tanks on dams, the use of water releases to, to stop one army from moving across a particular territory, um, a whole series of interesting examples. So, in the conflict chronology, I said it goes back 5,000 years. Uh, in seven, there's one entry for 1776. Uh, one of my hobbies, this is a little bit of an aside, is I, how, how many of you know what the word scribophily means? Yeah. Okay, not really. So scribophily is a, is a, it's a silly word, but it means the collection of uh, stock and bond certificates, old stock and bond certificates. So that's pretty obscure, right? Okay? Um, it turns out that when companies and cities raise money for water infrastructure, or, or for anything, for energy, for building schools, uh, in the Western world, we sold stocks or bonds, public bonds, or we sold stocks if it was a private company. In the <coughs> 1700s and 1800s and 1900s, uh, they issued certificates, often beautiful examples of artistic certificates with, with engravings and old calligraphy and, and so on. And I happen to collect old stock and bond certificates related to water. They're beautiful. They're, they're works of art. I'm not going to show you any other pictures, but I, I could. I could spend the whole time. Someday I'm going to give a lecture about, about the history of stock and bond certificates. A lot of them were issued for the city of London, for the water agencies uh, in the 1700s and 1800s that built water infrastructure in London. And they're beautiful. They're on vellum. Some of them are on vellum. Anyway, that's what it's In 1776, New York City was having trouble with its water supply. Uh, they had outgrown the wells and the local ponds that they, 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 they were contaminated with human waste, they were, they, the volume wasn't su sufficient, and New York City was trying to raise money to build a new water system of some kind. And the steam pump had just been invented. And it, New York City issued, and you notice it's in shillings, not dollars, little bonds, notes, to people to pay for the building of a big new modern 
steam pump to pump water from a new clean well. And this is actually, it's sideways. <laughs> but you can see it's, a, it's basically a steam pump. Here's the boiler, and there's the little piston, and it goes up and down, and there's the well, the, the chain it goes up and down, and it pumps water. It's a steam pump. And so this is, this is advanced water technology in 1776. This is actually an example of this certificate. I, I own this one, I own a couple others. This was the first water certificate issued for infrastructure in, in, in America. They started to build the system, and then the revolution, what I call the Revolutionary War. What do you, what do you call it? The War of, I don't know. Revolutionary War. The Revolutionary War? Okay. Maybe, maybe I can call it the War of Independence. Anyway. The British occupied New York in 1776, and the city was burned to the ground. I'm not going to get into whose fault it was. <laughs> uh, there's some dispute about that, whether it was the British or whether it was George Washington's troops retreating. But the water pump burned to the ground, and New York City's water supply was set back for another 30 or 40 years. But, but that's, that's an example of water conflict in my my. Some new concerns at the intersection of water and energy. Water and energy are an interesting thing. I'm not going to talk much about that. And security. First of all, water and economic development. In the old days, it was country A versus country B. I want your water, uh, inner, inner border disputes, that kind of thing. But increasingly, we see concerns at the intersection of water and economic development. The issue of poverty, the issue of water allocation, and the issue of, and the issue of uh, water rights. Increasingly, we see subnational, state to state, and I don't mean nation state to nation state, but Karnataka to Tamil Nadu in India, for example, uh, disputes, ethnic disputes, local disputes, pastoralists versus farmers in Africa are increasingly problems that we see in the day. Uh, increasing water access to terror, water related acts of terrorism, and I would argue direct and in the long term indirect impacts of climate change. And let me talk a little bit about climate change and water. We're changing the climate. There's little dispute about that in the scientific community. Uh, this is a graph that shows temperature anomalies, that is, differences from the long term average going back. Uh, almost 2,000 years, this is a reconstruction done uh, both here and in the United States uh, from paleoclimatic data, and then actual measurements uh, in this, measurements of this uh, instrumental record in the last 150 years or so, showing the very significant changes in temperature over the last 2,000 years. This is the famous hockey state, for those of you who follow this today. And I would argue that climate change is not just a temperature issue. The idea that it was global warming, there's been a change in the, in the language of this discussion away from global warming toward climate, climate change because of the realization that it's not just about temperature. And in particular, it's about water. It's the hydrologic cycle that I've talked about already. The hydrologic cycle is the water cycle, and it's the climate cycle as well. And as we change the climate, we're going to change and are already changing the hydrologic cycle. This is a photograph from the Mississippi River flooding in the year 2000. This is what we call, this was what hydrologists called a 1 in a 500 year flood event. That is the severity of storm one would expect on the Mississippi River once every 1 in 500 years on average. Unfortunately, in 1993, there was another, seven years before this, there was another 1 in a 500 year flood event on the Mississippi River. Now, from a statistical point of view, that's okay. We can have two one in a 500 year flood events in a 10 year period and not have another one for a thousand years, and the statistics would be okay. But it makes people nervous. And in fact, we're seeing an increased frequency of extreme events, extreme hydrologic events, floods and droughts uh, in many parts of the world that are increasingly scientifically being attributed in part to 
to climate change. And there's a fascinating, the, the research in the climate community around understanding the connection between climate change and the statistics and the physics of extreme events is a very exciting field right now. It's also not just a scientific question. It's a question of communications and politics. Uh, this is a photograph. You can't really see it, but it's a photograph from what we are now calling Superstorm Sandy that hit the New York City region last year. Uh, it was by hurricane standards, not that big a hurricane. In fact, by the time it hit landfall, it wasn't literally a hurricane measured by the speed of the winds, but it was an incredibly devastating storm. And the size of the storm, I'll show you a picture of that in a minute, the physical side of the storm, the size of the storm, was enormous. And it coincided with high tide, and it coincided with very intense rainfall, and it coincided with the fact that sea level on the eastern seaboard of the United States is six to nine inches higher today than it was 100 years ago because of sea level rise, in part because of climate change. Did climate change cause Superstorm Sandy? No. That's the wrong communications definition. We're not, no one is arguing that climate change is, that we understand it well enough, that climate change is causing extreme events. Is it influencing extreme events? Yes. And in fact, the argument increasingly in the communications area now is that all weather events are increasingly influenced by the fact that temperatures are higher, sea level is higher, uh, there's more water vapor in the atmosphere because of human-induced climate change. And this was the cover of Business Week magazine week after Superstorm Sandy, because it stimulated a debate, a national debate in the United States, and an international debate to some degree, that we have to stop ignoring the role of climate change. It's an interesting change from 10 or 20 years ago. This is a satellite photo of Superstorm Sandy, just to orient you here. Uh, this is New Jersey, right here. This is Long Island. This is Manhattan right here. The storm is going around like this. This was a massive storm. It wasn't necessarily a hurricane, but it was in size and impact. As you know, 50 billion, 60 billion dollars worth of damage. A massive, massive event. And the impact on extreme events of climate change hasn't gone unnoticed by people whose economic interests are affected. Uh, Munich Re is one of the world's largest reinsurance agencies. They repackage insurance systems. Um, needless to say, insurers are very sensitive to storms and extreme events because they, they, they insure against them. Uh, they insure against coastal flooding. They insure, they insure against droughts, that sort of thing. And Munich Re has issued a series of reports about climate change. And one of them recently said, quote, the only plausible explanation for the rise in weather-related catastrophes is climate change. And this is the graph they showed, and basically you can't read it, but this is the number of natural catastrophes in North America from 1980 to 2011. It's just the number of events. It's not the value of damages. Um, for the red, the tiny little red one is geophysical events. This is basically earthquakes. The, the green is meteorological events. And this is storms. Um, particular hurricanes. The blue is hydrological events, that's flooding events on rivers, um, and the red is climatological events. And to be honest, I'm not quite sure of the distinction how they distinguish between meteorological events and, and climatological events. But they see this trend and they start to worry. Because they set insurance rates based on past history. And if climate is not static, but dynamic, if climate change is real, then they have to rethink their economic models. So this is a summary of that. All extreme weather events are now subject to human influence. We're loading the dice, this is a colloquialism, we're loading the probability dice and we're painting higher numbers on them. 
So what does peak water mean? It doesn't mean we're going to run out of water overall. Water is mostly a renewable resource. It does mean we're going to run up against renewable flow constraints that are a combination of natural limits on how much we can take and economic and political and ecological constraints. When water is non-renewable, we're going to run into stock constraints. And that's the peak non-renewable water piece of this puzzle. And we're increasingly hitting or exceeding peak ecological limits. So the Colorado River, I showed you the graph, reaches zero, doesn't reach its delta anymore. There was, a, there, was a, there was a fishing community in the mouth of the delta that depended on a very vibrant fishery that the delta supported, that flow of fresh water and salt water in the mouth of the delta. The Yellow River Delta doesn't reach its mouth in most years. And you know, the Nile River Delta often dries up. Uh, we're reaching peak ecological constraints as well. And there are economic and political limitations to those problems. Let me close with some comments about research needs and priorities. Uh, this could be a really long list and it's not going to be comprehensive. But where are we reaching peak water constraints? Can we quantify non-renewable limits? Uh, we don't measure groundwater use and recharge very well. Can we quantify ecological limits and requirements? So on the Colorado River, how much flow ought to we restore, ought to we restore, restore in the Colorado River? And where's that water going to come from? Who's, which of the users, current users on the Colorado is going to give up water, if any of them? What are the implications of peak limits? Physical implications, economic, social, political, in what mixes? What's the role of climate? If climate is non-stationary, and is going to change flows in rivers or extreme events. How do we factor that into our water management decisions? And finally, can we evaluate, and from my perspective, more importantly, can we reduce the risks of water security problems? Can we reduce the risks of conflict over water? Uh, we're pretty good at it at the international level. We have international treaties. One of the reasons why I would argue we see fewer and fewer, or at least a smaller proportion, of conflicts over water at the, at the international level is countries tend to negotiate over water. We have diplomatic tools. We don't necessarily have the tools at the subnational level to deal with those kinds of problems, the kinds of problems we're seeing. And in that sense, the risk of conflicts over water may also be. I think in the long run, there are solutions to our problems. I think uh, we can rethink supply of water. We can rethink demand for water. Uh, I think we can rethink smart economics and the role of economics. Uh, we can rethink technology. There are technological solutions to our water challenges. Uh, long term, the soft path for water that I also write about that I'm not going to talk about is a, is a combination of all of those things. There's no single bullet to solving our water problems. But getting this, the right combination in the right place at the right time uh, remains an unresolved challenge. Thank you very much.